Bill, very good to see you. I believe that Rebecca is in the room as well. Yes, good to see you as well. Um, so I will introduce those two speakers in just a minute, but first let me take a second to explain the purpose of this panel. So as I said in my introduction, computational antitrust, antitrust is becoming a necessity. It's hard to imagine a competition agency 10 years from now, or even five years from now, without any computational tools. So in the next 50 minutes, we will discuss how to embrace the future of antitrust. We will talk about how to merge antitrust and computational expertise. We will talk about education. We will talk about what competition agencies can do, whether it is in the coming weeks or in the coming years. All right, now on to the panelists. First of all, uh, Mayetcher unfortunately cannot join us, uh, but luckily we have two stellar speakers with us today. I will start with you, Rebecca. Uh, you are a professor of public and criminal law in association with the uh, Pembroke College at Oxford University. Uh, you are teaching a course amongst other uh, entitled Law and Computer Science, and you are publishing on related topic. Um, you also specialize in criminal law. So uh, very luckily, uh, you will bring a different and unique expertise to our, to our discussion. We are very grateful to have you with us and on our board. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we are also thank joined by you. Bill. Um, who is the Global Competition Professor of Law and Policy at George Washington University, where he is also the director of the Competition, uh, Competition Law Center. Bill, as you may know, served as the FTC, as NFTC commissioner from 2006 to 2008, and as the chairman of the FTC from 2008 to 2009. He is one of the world's leading experts in antitrust, in fact, I believe it is more likely that someone in the audience today has never drunk water than it is that you can find an antitrust lawyer who is not familiar with Bill's work. So again, to both of you, welcome. Now, we have decided for this panel and all of the other panels not to have long presentations, but to have back and forth between the speakers and the moderators, including for this one. I asked my two speakers to give me short answers, even though I realized that some of those questions will realize will probably require more than a couple hours to answer them properly, but that's unfair and that's the way I like it. So because the panel is entitled The Future of Computational Antitrust, the first set of questions will concern tomorrow's future. So we will discuss here actionable items, and then we'll move on to a long distant future. So I'll start with you, Bill. Uh, first of all, very nice to see you as always. Great um, to be here, thank you. There is this quote um, from uh, George Orwell's famous book. I quote, who controls the past controls the future. And I believe the very same could be said for antitrust law. Who controls the past of antitrust controls the future of antitrust. This leads me to discuss something that I know you've been advocating for uh, for quite some time indeed, agencies looking at their past activities in order to better understand and better define their future policies. So starting at the level of each individual jurisdiction, how could they use computational tools to actually better document what they've done in the past? I Kibo, thank you for the delightful opportunity to participate in the panel, um, and congratulations on building a new institution so successfully. I, I think it's a, an axiom of experience with so many institutions in different areas of life that successful institutions progress through learning. Uh, they take account of past activity, they take account of past experiments, and they use experience, good and bad, to inform the way ahead. And that body of experience gives them an advantage in formulating new policies. I would suggest that in the area of antitrust enforcement, there's something that we could call big antitrust data. 
This is the assembly of all information about what agencies have done in the past by way of enforcement and activity. To learn, you have to know it's there. And I'm afraid there's an epidemic failure in our field to build good data sets within individual agencies and certainly across agencies about activity. Uh, to take one example, uh, a, a common lament about competition law is that uh, antitrust agencies for too long ignored innovation in uh, evaluating mergers or other practices. Uh, if this was true, that would be a damning uh, failure uh, of policy over time to ignore such a crucial factor in growth. Uh, fortunately, uh, in actually looking at what agencies have done, it's not true. Uh, there are a number of instances in which it was taken directly into account with supremacy over considerations about pricing, for example, or output levels. Uh, you only know that by being able to access earlier matters in which it was taken into account and to learn from the methodology that was used to account for dynamic considerations and innovation effects. Uh, today, if you want to do that, you have to build those data sets by hand. Uh, and for a researcher, that is a, a crippling disability. Uh, you can do it, but it's a brutal process. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were searchable databases within agencies that could allow you to summon this up, not just for the last couple of years, but let's say going back over decades? Uh, that would be a great advantage. It's, uh, it's terribly hard to do today. For agencies themselves, it would be so useful to be able to extract, say, from past cartel cases uh, to take the collusion concerns that Susan was raising, uh, antecedents to the current development of machine learning techniques for facilitating collusion. Wouldn't it be interesting to pick out of earlier cases instances in which we had some faint replicas of this problem arising earlier and seeing not only how agencies responded, but to appreciate the infinite adaptation of business enterprises uh, to the point that the collusion arms race is never over and the infinite adaptability of firms suggests that one has to continue to develop programs. Uh, so uh, a, a, a useful frontier for better computational work is to improve the input that would go into the computations. And that is developing data sets, databases uh, that provide a meaningful view at one moment and across time of what agencies uh, have done. Yeah, and of course you mentioned um, ignoring or pretending to ignore past cases, right? So for instance, cases in which innovation was taken into consideration, let's say 20 years ago, you may see this bias in research or policy, but this bias will not exist within competition agencies because of course what they want is to better understand what they've done, right? And if they've indeed uh, addressed innovation 20 years ago, this is relevant information for them. So the good thing here is that they have a very strong incentive to come up with the right data. Uh, and I'm reminded of um, a paper we published by the French competition agency, uh, data team in which they actually created a network of all of their decisions, um, over 60, hundred decisions, put them in a network and made references, um, and, uh, actually displayed those decisions, depending on how many times one decision was being cited by, uh, all the decisions, right. And yeah. to the surprise of the agency, uh, and to my surprise, although I thought that I knew a little bit about French competition law. Of course, some decisions we knew were cited a lot, but some other decisions we ignored. Even, even the agency itself ignored that some of those decisions were cited a lot, which tells a lot, once again, because it may mean that you are comfortable with going after this kind of practice on the market. It may mean that you may want to redirect your policy a little bit, or that indeed the practice is being implemented a lot on the market. So... Uh, I believe you wanted to react to that. Yeah, yeah Thibault, I, I think the technique that the authority used is exactly the right one. You want a comprehensive set of material that doesn't just present aggregates of activity. Uh, to tell me that you did 10 of those or five of those is useful to a point, but I want to know what's in your, in, your, in your collection. With links that tell me the subsequent history, that's the methodology to follow. And if you have this profile of activity, there are all sorts of things you can learn over time. Um, you can detect patterns of how to build cases. You start to notice that often a big bang case that represents a major extension of the state of the art 
stood on foundations of smaller cases, which seen in isolation had minor economic stakes, might have been seen as unimportant. If you were hunting for big game, you'd never go after them. But if you saw them as the stepping stones to doing something bolder later on, you'd always have them in the portfolio as a way of building doctrine. So you see all kinds of fascinating patterns that enable you to predict something about how to build doctrine, how to extend frontiers, how to develop future cases, what kinds of ideas you can extract from past experience. The only way to do it is to know accurately what that past experience was. And the kind of data set that the Autorite put together, I would suggest would be a useful starting point for a global standard about how agencies should report activity. Yeah. And in that paper, by the way, available open access on our website, computationalantitrust.com, you, you can also access the graph on the Autorite de la Concurrence uh, website. Uh, they actually provide the entire methodology they've been using and uh, strongly encourage all the competition agencies to build such a graph. And why not to build such an international graph, right? Where you would see competition agencies quoting all the competition agencies, which brings me again to you, Bill, to the idea and the debate um, surrounding the idea of uh, making competition law more international, right? It seems to me that the debate is maybe less intense nowadays uh, than what it used to be, perhaps because of a big divide between the US and the EU created by the new Brandeisians. But in any case, it doesn't mean that this debate is not relevant. Um, and in fact, I believe that using computational tools, such as creating a network, but it could be also that you want to conduct all the type of studies, uh, you could actually make competition agencies in a position to better learn from each other. So what would you say here? What Which kind of data would you like to see, not when it comes to each individual jurisdiction, but again, looking at all competition agencies uh, from a network perspective? At a high level, a benefit of having 140 jurisdictions with competition systems, that's 110 more than we had in 1990, you know, barely 30 years ago, is that it provides a enabling environment for a lot of experimentation where a good idea doesn't have to enter the system, the global system on a big scale. It can enter through one jurisdiction and the jurisdiction more than any other that set us on the path of the kind of developments that Susan was describing was the United Kingdom's Competition and Markets Authority. They made the investment in the data team. They put together a team of 50. Other jurisdictions have learned from that. I'd suggest without a rigorous proof that that's been the catalyst for moving other jurisdictions to going beyond having the chief technologist isolated in an office, but to build a real integrated capability. Um, the, the network that could tie together agencies enables them to learn from what others are doing. This is learning not only from your own experience, but learning from others accelerating the process of learning and taking into account the developments, good and bad, that have occurred with the experiments. So, so a networked approach to policymaking in this arena allows experimentation to take place, but crucially, uh, it ties together jurisdictions by allowing them to see what's working, what's not working, uh, learning, coordinating approaches. Jurisdictions that might not have the capacity on their own to build a robust system using a regional approach might be able to replicate some of the same capabilities and techniques. Um, this uh, enables you again to progress in the direction of experimentation and learning that advances the adoption of practices and enables their adjust adjustment over time. Uh, and we've seen that happening, better coordination, networking, cooperation, all of those things can accelerate the process of adopting uh, practices that are working. And very importantly, pointing out dead ends that haven't been successful. All right. So now on that basis, I am absolutely delighted, Rebecca, to welcome you on this panel, precisely because you are not an antitrust expert and we can actually merge your expertise with Bill's expertise. Some of the papers that we published by non-antitrust experts were actually the most groundbreaking, I believe. 
and you have great expertise when it comes to uh, computational law, generally speaking, but more precisely when it comes to algorithmic decision making. So let us assume that competition agencies, but we can even talk about all agencies, have indeed a better view of what they've done in the past thanks to Bill's suggestion, right? This means that competition agencies may realize, okay, I've done too many tying cases. I now want to do a new type of case. So I will go out there, meaning on the market. I will start doing my best to detect practices. And then let's say that, oh, finally, I may have a case. So I may have a practice that I need to investigate. Now, you've been working on the oversight of algorithmic decision-making and the potential use of judicial review tools. And those tools are often designed to optimize decision-making, but the questions, of course, becomes optimized to what end? So can you please tell us more about the main benefits and the pitfalls, I believe, that competition agencies or all agencies, in fact, should consider when relying on algorithmic decision making? Yeah, thank you so much for the question and, and also for the invitation. It, it's a great treat to be here. And as you say, not exactly my, my sort of sphere of expertise and, and to hear from your other speakers. And I think um, one of the things that we have to think about, which is very much a point which was raised um, by your previous speaker, Professor Rathi, is um, the use, the metric that we use to assess our choice of system. She was talking about choosing a particular kind of system for a particular context. And one of the things that we need to think about as we make those choices is which metric we're using to assess the performance of a particular system to decide whether it's a, a system we want to adopt. The most sort of straightforward one of those that we can think about is sort of a you know false positive, false negative rate, things like that. But we know that there are, of course, huge numbers of other metrics that we might use, specificity um, and recall sensitivity and so on. And that's before we get into specific metrics, which look at, for example, disparity across subgroups. So even looking at the performance of the system as a whole, there are a large number of different metrics that we might choose. And the problem is that no system is going to perform well against every single one of those metrics. So it is going to be a policy choice as to which of the metrics you want it to perform well against and which ones you can live with it performing badly against. And we really do need that kind of theory of metric choice, and we need the law to develop that theory. It's not completely alien to the law. There are existing examples of sort of embryonic forms of it in the law that we could build up, but it is going to have to be built up and it is going to have to become much more sophisticated. So you mentioned that I am familiar with the criminal context, and there's a great example there, the, the famous example of the Compass risk prediction system. And the, that was effectively a battle of the metrics between North Point and ProPublica, because ProPublica point out that it has a much higher false positive rate for black defendants, much higher false negative rate for white ones. North Point doesn't come along and go, oh, yes, you got is What they say is yes, but it achieves predictive parity. So against our metric, which is the one we think is important, our system is functioning just fine. Thank you. And you need the law to have a system for saying yes, but in this context, that is not the metric you should be looking at. Or there is a reason why you should be looking at the, the ProPublica metric, at least as well as the metric that you have chosen. And that's what we need the law to sort of build up and do. And say, even in a context where you're not talking about disparity across subgroups, then you still need to, to think about your, your theory of metric choice. And I think um, that one of the legal rules we can look to to really help us here is the doctrine of proportionality, which is one that we can borrow across from public law, because, as you said before, public law is a, an area of law designed to optimise and improve and make more fair and more accurate our decision making. So it kind of has an ideal set of tools that we can then borrow across into other areas of law when we're thinking about controlling decision making of a new kind in this algorithmic context. And there are sort of three bits to, to proportionality, as you'll know, and the, we can look at the first of all at the test of suitability to say, well, is the metric we've chosen suitable to achieve, achieve the aim that we are trying to achieve with our decision making system? So what is it we're trying to do? And is performance against this metric going to help us with that? So is our metric that we've chosen suitable for um, achieving the, the system, what it is that we want the system to achieve. So, for example, we wouldn't want to adopt a COVID test that had a really high negative rate because that's not going to do the job that we want a COVID test to do, for example. We can also look at the fair balance part of proportionality 
to weigh the ways in which the system performs well against the ways in which it performs badly. So this would be the answer to our, our North Point compass problem, is we would say, well, yes, you are getting some gains in terms of prediction, but you're also having some disadvantages in terms of the, the increase in disparity. And so we think overall, those disadvantages outweigh on a fair balance basis, the advantages that you might be getting. And finally, we can look at the necessity part of proportionality, which, of course, asks us to check whether we're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut when a nutcracker would do instead. And one of the good examples of this um, comes from a paper by Rodolfo et al. And they point out that you can sometimes have a ground truth matched system. So if you're using a predictive system, you can sometimes have a system where you actually test it against ground truth before you operationalize whatever it is that the system is predicting. So their example was people who were flagged for some kind of social service intervention, but that intervention would only actually happen if they did indeed end back up in the in the criminal justice system again. So that the sort of, there's a flag put next to their name, but only when they're back in the system is that flag triggered and then the intervention is triggered. So if it's possible to wait until you have a ground truth matched system, then that's obviously a, a better way of dealing with it than just sort of prediction on its own. And that also allows you to do the, some of the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of learning from what's happened so far, you can then also feed that back into the system. So I think those sorts of tools are the kind of thing that we already have in the law, but we can then use those tools to develop a, a framework for helping us with things like metric choice. And of course, metric choice is only one example of, of one of the sorts of challenges that we're going to have to face in this context. So um, I don't, I'm not sure if you have seen this paper or it's an article that the MIT Tech Review published quite a few years ago where it's about compass and you can actually uh, do it yourself, right? So you could say, well, this is where I think we should put, you know, on the scale from letting people in jail or taking no chance of that. Um, and then I'm using that in the classroom and, and very quickly you realize then there is no perfect efficiency, right? Which would mean to let all the bad people in jail and all the good one free. Um, and so you have to make, to come up with kind of moral decisions um, and so you provided us with a framework for which, you know, from the point of view, we, we can actually uh, approach the subject. I guess maybe a follow-up question would be, uh, are you aware of um, any government or agency making those three variables uh, transparent? So telling the public, well, this is the choice we've made in terms of, you know, efficiency, accuracy, and so on and so forth. So it's a really, really good question. So um, I likewise talk to my students about it. And of course, I'm at Pembroke in Oxford, and we're very proud of the fact that Blackstone has a long association with, with Pembroke College and, and also we know with the US. And of course, that that's exactly it. He is famous for having said, well, you know, better 10 guilty men go free than one innocent person goes to prison. We have a more recent case in the UK in the context of terrorism where the judge says, well, hang on a minute, you know, let, let's actually have a think about these numbers. I'm not going to go for that if it's, you know, 100 guilty mm. people going free. So where, where exactly are we going to draw the line? And that's exactly what I say to the students is, well, look, you know what, they're, they're not computer scientists, they're talking in, in those terms. But if they were, they'd be talking about how high a false positive versus false negative rate are they each comfortable with. And if they were using computer science terminology, that that's the conversation that the, the two jurists would, would be having across the centuries. So, the, yes, I think we do. We really do have those tools in terms of are we am I aware of them being made public? No. One of the things that I have um, written about and, and thought about a lot is that I would like there to be more algorithmic transparency on the part of governments in terms of the choices that they're making, even frankly, in terms of um, revealing the systems that they are using, the context they're using them in, what they're using them for. And as your previous speaker was saying, which of the models they've chosen for those contexts, particularly, and also what metrics have they then used to test them? Um, we do have a thing called the algorithmic transparency reporting standard in the UK, um, which was uh, which is something that was that's developed um, by in combination between government and, and other agencies. But it's not compulsory to use it. So there are some examples on the website if you go to it, and it is a great tool. But there's no compulsory incentive to require um, agencies or, or government entities to register their algorithms on that that system. So I think that would be a, I think that would be a great first step. Actually, it'll be be compulsory transparency and also transparency around some of these model choice metric choice decisions. Yeah, and of course, one of the um, particularities of the DOJ is that that institution has to bring cases before the court, right? And then explain why this model, I know that it was considered at some point that the same will be implemented for the European Commission, but this is not how it works. The European Commission can actually investigate and then sanction the, 
the companies themselves. Although, of course, those companies could always appeal, go before the general court, and there you may want to see, uh, or you may have transparency, right? Or actually the making public of uh, what they've been doing. Now, you've mentioned criminal law quite a few times, and actually, I think what's interesting and maybe at the intersection between here antitrust and criminal law is that some antitrust practices especially in the united states but also in the eu not at the eu level but at the member state level can be called criminal right now last week actually just last friday the european parliament european council and the european commission just voted the ai act uh we don't have the final draft but from the previous draft, what we've seen is that it will contain provisions that will have a major impact on the use of computational tools to detect criminal activities. In a nutshell, the AI Act tells agencies that if they use these tools to detect and analyze potentially criminal practices, then these tools are to be considered high risk, which comes with many legal requirements. So to put it in another way, the AI Act may create a disincentive to use computational tools to detect a practice that a member state is saying is calling criminal, such as a cartel in certain member states. Although if they are called criminal, those antitrust practices are the most harmful, at least on paper, right? This is the reason why they are called criminal. So my question to both of you is, what is your take on these provisions which from what I understood, was taken really to, you know, for hardcore criminal law, but may have reminiscence in a sense when it comes to antitrust. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to. Sure, take. thank you. Um, so I think I think you've um, hit the nail on the head, actually, with your your last um, point, which is that there is, that's exactly right, that, that criminal law spans a, a wide spectrum of behaviour and, and provisions which may have been intended for the sort of more blue collar end of, of criminal law absolutely have that, that implication even in an antitrust context. And I think that's right. I also um, share your concern if the balance is struck in the wrong direction. So there is obviously a balance to be struck between the advantages of, of you know, increased efficiency, increased accuracy, actually increased fairness, we don't always talk about with the system, but but they can be less biased than humans in some contexts um, and more, more um, consistent. But obviously we know also from things like Compass that there are, there are potential downsides as well. So it really is very much again about thinking of how we strike that balance. How do we mitigate against the risks, but how do we get the advantages? Another point to make is is the you know the possibility for increased efficiency and for criminal justice agencies generally, particularly actually in a non antitrust context, there are real resource challenges at the moment, and this is a thing which you know computational tools absolutely have the capacity to help with. You know, decreased legal aid, massive overstretched court systems, particularly post COVID, there is a huge capacity there for for computational tools to help which and uh, this coupled with the the point that bill was making earlier which i was nodding furiously at the lack of available data sets to help with the building of tools in the first place i think these are some real challenges which stand in the way of what could actually be very helpful uses of technology um, in this sort of context provided that we can mitigate against those disadvantages the other thing to say again is that not only obviously again we haven't seen the the sort of final text um as of friday but in the previous draft, a lot of the terminology actually, even though the AI Act existed, a lot of the terminology is still very open textured. There were a lot of references to things like relevance or suitability or, you know, choice of the data from a relevant or similar context. Well, there's a lot of, and you know, choice of a, an appropriate metric. There's a lot of, of sort of work to be done by those words, um, which is sort of left really for the future. And that, again, I think is where we can bring some of our existing legal tools and our existing legal conversations about those things to help us to interpret those those provisions as and when we do get them in the final draft. Yeah, so two things, Bill, before I go, to, I go to you. First, indeed, we have a political agreement on the AI Act, but this is just an agreement. Now you need to put that on paper and see if you agree regarding the way this will be drafted, right, which is a big one. Second of all, um, the AI Act applies to all the companies, regardless you are a US-based or Chinese-based company, as long as you do operate on the EU uh, market. It does not apply to a EU company that will be designing a tool to be put on the US market, but it means that then, uh, go to you, Bill, this AI Act is also relevant for the US companies, right? Because if they do something which may be seen as being criminal in EU competition law, 
then indeed it seems that the agencies will have to comply with all of those requirements as opposed to investigating a practice which is not criminal in nature. So what is your take on this provision of the AI Act? Uh, it's, a, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, I think at some point we will have a political scientist, maybe it will be a PhD student, uh, have access to the deliberations that led to the formulation of the new legislative proposal. And one focus of that discussion might be, what kind of consultation did you do with other agencies, other uh, domains of law that might be affected by what you're doing? Because every time we have new legislation of this kind, and, and footnote, this is happening very fast. Uh, we obviously have a race across jurisdictions to see who will plant the flag of regulation in this field first. Uh, the Biden administration's executive order was, I think, clearly an effort to say we got outflanked on the DMA and the GDPR. It's not going to happen again for AI. Uh, so we're going to get our product out there on the market as fast as we can. So there's there's a rush to do this. And I understand the urgency from a policy uh, point of view, but there is an interjurisdictional rivalry uh, to be first as well. And, and if you use the, you know, the, 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 the biological metaphors that are popular now, think about ecosystems. Well, there's an ecosystem of complex other legal and regulatory commands that blend into each other. They sometimes occupy adjacent uh, realms, but you can see the adoption of new law as putting a new species into that ecology. And a biologist would ask, well, what are the side effects going to be? How, how, how does that fit into the larger ecology? Um, maybe the European Parliament is thinking about that question. Maybe it isn't, uh, or maybe that's an afterthought. And, and notice, notice what else is happening at the moment uh, that is the cascade of regulatory controls. It was the DMA, it's the DSA, it's foreign direct investment, it's foreign subsidy control. All of this has happened within a period of about five years. It's almost as though every six months there's another fundamental change. Uh, and on the U.S. side, there are, no, there are new controls on outbound uh, uh, investment that, that has a national security impact. Um, in the cascade of regulatory activity, how do individual legislators even have the opportunity or capacity to ask, how does this fit into the larger framework? Uh, I've seen a couple of political scientists just map out the complexity of the regulatory framework affecting tech over the past 20 or so years. And what you end up is a more and more cluttered graphic uh, that shows the 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 expansion of controls, uh, their their broad reach. Uh, I, I guess a question again that I have here: it's 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 uh, the the regulatory process lags behind commercial developments, but the regulatory process now is extremely dynamic. It's multifaceted, and I don't have the sense that it's taking account of side effects and spillovers that, that might occur at the margin. It's almost as though we've got to build it, see how it works, and then we'll retrofit later on to address consequences that, that, that come up. I, I guess I'd feel a lot better if I had confidence that those kinds of considerations were being taken into account. And on the point of data collection and analysis, uh, it would be nice if there was a place you could look just to see what individual jurisdictions have in the regulatory pipeline, in the legislative pipeline, and as each item comes through the pipeline, to add that to the list so that as an analyst, you could say, this is what's happened the past 12 months, the past 24 months, the past 20, 36 months, uh, as a way in part of, the, of, of asking, what happens when you put the new species into the regulatory ecology? Uh, maybe it's benign, but I'm not sure the question is even being asked. Yeah, and if it's a complex network, indeed, it may be that one new species may actually create chaos in the entire ecosystem, right? So we'll see if the AI Act is doing that for us. Uh, if so, this, mean, this will mean more conferences and more papers to be written on the subject anyway. All right, Thank looking, at, 
the long distant future now. Uh, I'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, so both of you are professors, which means that normally you do research, but you also teach. Um, and I know that you um, have thought a lot about how you approach your law students when the subject is indeed computational in nature. Uh, I can share my two cents on the subject when teaching about competition law and introducing the student to econometrics. I could see that some of them will complain, telling me, well, I didn't come to law school to learn about mathematics. Uh, when I do teach about the functioning of AI, basic skills when it comes to coding, I could see that they, they, there is like um, um, a strong interest and a desire to learn, uh, which pleased me to to and surprised me to the to the highest degree. So, what is your experience, and what do you and how do you approach again teaching computational law, computational things to to legal students? So, no, it's a great question, and it is very much something that we've we've had to grapple with um, during the course that we do in Oxford. And we do um, for both groups. So we I teach the course is completely interdisciplinary. There is always a member of each faculty at the front of the classroom, and there's always equal numbers of students from the law and the computer science faculties in the classroom as students. Um, and we do do some sort of work with what what my colleague calls on ramping at the beginning of the session. So we will explain the the computer science concepts relatively basically for the for the law students to understand, and we'll explain the relevant legal concepts basically enough for the for the computer scientists to understand. We do a lot of sort of basic on ramping work at the beginning of the course, looking at things like metrics, confusion matrix, this kind of thing. Um, but what we generally find is that actually stripping back both the disciplines to their, their really sort of very simple component elements is actually of benefit to the students from that discipline, as well as to the students from the sort of other discipline, if you like. And we find that everybody says and when we've sort of surveyed students at the end of the course, they've all said that they understand their own discipline better for having had to look at it through the sort of beginner's eyes of a, of a completely different discipline. And I think sometimes having a, a more computational lens actually does help us to understand all better. Putting Blackstone's expression in terms of what he's really talking about is false positive and false negative rates. I think it does sort of give us a different lens to look at our own subjects. And sometimes it gives us a different set of tools to articulate the conversations that we were trying to have, but perhaps didn't have quite the right tools to articulate what it was we were trying to say before. And if you're looking in an area like like public law, I mean, for example, I operate in a system which has no written constitution. So we're always sort of thinking about the legitimacy of court intervention and, and court behavior in these contexts and actually having a sort of more computational, more mathematical approach to what it is we're doing when we use terms like fairness or bias or whatever it might be. That can actually legitimate, I think, sometimes certainly make clearer, but possibly also legitimate the operation of law. So I think there are huge benefits to lawyers from, from being able to see their, their discipline through this more kind of computational lens. And like you, I find that the students are, are really keen to engage with that. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm reminded of this video um, in a conference, I think at the University of Chicago when uh, Ronald Coase uh, said that it is actually easy for lawyers to learn about economics, but it is much harder for economists to learn about the law. Uh, I wonder to some degree if the same could be said when it comes to computer science. What What is your take maybe on that? What is your experience? Yeah. Because you said 50-50, so yeah, I suppose yeah, the computer scientists that will struggle, right? <laughs> absolutely. No, and I, I think um, I think so, sometimes we're a great disappointment to our, our computer science colleagues because, for example, I, I did a, a technical project which actually was about sort of gathering and, and storing data about decision making in a system and using provenance methods to, to kind of record all the decision points in the design and building of a system. And my computer science colleagues would sort of say to me, right, what are the things that the law would want to know? And I'm well, kind of everything really so what are the pieces of information that we need to capture all of it everything because you never know what might be what might be relevant or important and i think our, our the fact that we aren't always mathematical and the fact that we can't always pin our our rules down to an absolutely perfect algorithm for them i think sometimes is is a challenge to computer scientists so i think that's right i think they do understand why that is and i think you know they understand the sort of the need for flexibility and and, and deferring decisions that, that the law provides in those ways but i think sometimes that is i agree with you i think sometimes that is a challenge to my computer science colleagues we're not as logical as we like to think we are i think yeah and you know something you said earlier is that you have to ask yourself the question what it is that we want to do 
and actually in antitrust, this one, you know, you, you could take any antitrust expert and probably they will disagree on what the answer is, right? Whether it is to protect consumers and how do you do it? You protect the structure of the market, innovation, price, non-price, and so on and so forth. So great questions and put for thought in any case. Now on to you, Bill. In addition to teaching in a classroom, uh, you are constantly traveling the world to teach uh, antitrust agencies. Uh, up until recently, you were a non-executive director of the CMA, the UK Competition Agency. So you have seen a lot about the implementation of computational tools and computational antitrust. So my question is, how should we approach teaching computational tools to not the students in the classroom, but to agencies? Uh, I, I, I love the approach that uh, uh, Rebecca laid out. That is, I, I love having the two disciplines in the front, in the podium, and, and, and where possible, the interdisciplinary composition of the, the listening group, too. Uh, I think that's absolutely brilliant and uh, a, a wonderful way of promoting the discussion. I, I, I find that uh, one of the best approaches, and I, I think this is something that Susan touched on, is to to use a concrete case study or case that's a compelling example that shows how the principles can be worked. Start with something very basic and then try to extract broader observations from it. Uh, the, the concrete example is interesting. I think you pick an example with a product or service that everybody in the room is going to be familiar with, no matter where they are. Use that to, to develop the problem and to use that also to draw in specific activities or initiatives that other jurisdictions have been testing in the past. So pick a good concrete example, perhaps pick a case that they're familiar with, definitely pick a product or service that they know very well, have a multidisciplinary team at the podium uh, guiding the discussion, bring in, if possible, a representative from an agency that's been down the path before. Uh, and we'll talk honestly about the good and the bad and the indifferent that came up in the in the course of the process. Uh, I think I think these are all 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 good ways to try and teach. And for for a suggestion about a starting point, public procurement would provide major examples for me. Everybody does it. It's such a core element of what government does, and it lends itself to a discussion of computational techniques so well. Yeah, indeed. Um... So, all right, so if you indeed come up with new ways, not only to educate people in the classroom and within the agencies, you will hopefully be prepare for a better future when it comes to computational antitrust. So now what I want to do is to ask you two final questions, uh, looking at a long distance future indeed. Um, I believe that the use of computational tools will change the substance of antitrust. Uh, we see already not looking at antitrust, but economic, economic theory that um, if something cannot be quantified, it is more easily rejected, right? And and maybe for good reasons, part of the profession will actually think that this is a shame and this should be changed. But if you look at the top five economic journals, you see that indeed there is a model and uh, quantifiable uh, variables. I think to some extent, the same is happening when it comes to antitrust uh, Susan uh, provided quite a few examples about how and and the reasons why you may want to be able to compute evidence to be able to indeed convince a judge that you're right. So if we take that a step further, can we imagine a future in which small cases are automatically litigated? So for example, uh, can we imagine a future in which the company's machine learning systems will be in uh, direct talk with the agency's machine learning systems to do automatic checks and compliances, maybe to raise red flags, maybe to redirect a little bit the policy of the companies, uh, or is it something just for sci-fi? Uh, maybe Rebecca, I'll start with you. So I think I think it is possible um, to have full automation. Um, I mean, we already do in some contexts. So you know, eBay disputes, for example, we're all quite happy to to turn over to a relatively automated system in, in those sorts of contexts. So I think it's possible. 
Um, what we need to think about is whether we want full automation like that or whether what we're thinking about more is, is decision making assistance. So a system which will say, you know, in nine times out of 10, the, the decision you would expect in this context would be this. Do you want to accept that decision or do you want to change it? Yes or no. There are pros and cons of having a human involved. We shouldn't just assume that that that, that the, the human is going to somehow act as a fail safe. We might actually see that the human makes those decisions more inconsistent, that they bring their own biases to bear. And we would rather that they said yes to the, the, the one suggested by the system than, than, than brought in their own ideas. So there are definite pros and cons to think about there. So I think we would want whatever system we adopted, whether it was sort of automated completely or whether it was just de decision making assistance, we'd want to monitor what was going on very closely and, and see whether it was in fact doing what we wanted it to do and whether there were any any sort of disadvantages for what was happening. More broadly, when we think about whether we want a human in the loop and, and sort of a, a question legally, generally, we tend to assume, I think at the moment, people tend to think that they want a human because they think they're going to be less error prone than a system. So I think the real challenges come when we move to a situation, if we move to a situation where actually systems are, are less error prone than humans and you can prove that you're getting a better outcome, because there's very often when you have these conversations, they say, oh, well, of course, we could never give X kind of a decision to a, an automated system. And you say, what well, really, even if it was going to outperform a human, even if you were going to get more consistent, more fair results, you still wouldn't hand it over. And so I think there is a bigger question there about are there circumstances where we still want to retain human decision making, even if actually that it, that becomes less good than automated decision making? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the really difficult question that we're going to have to answer. Yeah. And indeed, the time factor, I've seen empirical work where people will be willing indeed for, for the sake of time and saving time to get any decision right, uh, especially if the amount of the litigation is, of course, a small amount as opposed to, you know, litigating your home or your car. Bill, what is your take on a, on a subject? I, I can imagine the introduction of these methodologies, for example, in the monitoring of remedies uh, taking place again in an experimental manner. Uh, I would an anticipate perhaps that authorities would begin with the, the smaller prototype. Uh, I think of uh, uh, doing these the suborbital and orbital flights before I'd go to other planets and extraterrestrial bodies. Uh, I do the testing there. I'd examine the results. I'd subject them to uh, a, a process of examination by peers and outside evaluators. But I can I can imagine the path that one would take, and I, I take remedies as one example. That is a, a real time monitoring of outcomes and activities uh, where where you test it. Uh, and 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 I think on on on, on uh, to just on on to Rebecca's point uh, about. You know what degree of human intervention? Um, uh, I, I I would imagine that this is a place where certainly the humans have to be involved on a continuing basis with the experiments, uh, asking a couple of things. One is, uh, uh, what were our prior assumptions about how this would work in the best of all worlds? Uh, mm -hmm. What would Nirvana look like? What are we actually seeing? What kind of adaptation is taking place that we just didn't anticipate? Uh, adaptation by the business enterprises, adaptation by by the by the by the intelligent systems themselves. Uh, I mean, once we build the the HAL 9000 computer and set it to work, uh, how is it actually going to interact with the human beings uh, who are who are in the space station? Uh, so uh, I think. I, I would imagine a process of, of uh, absorption of adaptation through experiments, through prototypes, uh, but a, but a continuing effort on on the part of the the policymakers to to observe and evaluate effects. All right. So of course I've asked the question in a way that sounds a little bit horrible, right? To be provocative or maybe a bit a little bit of a dystopians, but indeed it might be that. You know, the counterfactual or what will happen without such a system is that instead of having nice behavioral remedies, you will have a structural remedy that would say, well, you have to break the company in three parts, right? So always have to consider what's real and uh, what's uh, happening without the use of those tools. All right. The very last question. We have one minute remaining. So I ask you to be very short, knowing that this is the question that will require the most time to answer. Uh, looking at uh, the field 10 years from now. Can we imagine a future in which computer scientists are in leadership positions in law firms and agencies? Let's let's even imagine, let's say, can we imagine an agency led by a computer scientist? Bill, I'll start with you. The place where it ought to happen 
or at least to be representative in the, represented in the leadership group is on multi-member boards. I would say any agency that has a multi-member board that says it wants to do work in this policy domain, is keen on tech, had better have somebody on the board. Now, now the past experience uh, with appointments in some agencies is not so good. In its glorious 108 year history, the Federal Trade Commission has had approximately 110 commissioners. Um, exactly four of them have been PhD economists. There've been three MBAs, there's been one engineer and the rest, yes, legions of lawyers. Uh, maybe in the FTC second century, it will get better. But I'd say mm. that if you want to be proficient in this area and be seen as proficient, there should be an urgency to make sure that on that board of five or on other boards of five or more, you've got at least one tech person who understands the technology. Maybe someday that person would be the chair too. Yeah, five plus five. Rebecca? Completely agree. Absolutely agree with the, the need for interdisciplinarity at all levels and in, in all of these questions. Um, and I, I do increasingly see that my CS students in my classroom are taking the course because they do genuinely see this as a, a viable career path for them. That as computer scientists, this is the world yeah. in which they're, they're going to put those skills to use. Obviously, to some extent, you know, who can lead law firms and so on is a kind of regulatory question in terms of what qualifications you need to have. But the other point to make is that it's not just interdisciplinary teams. I think increasingly we're seeing interdisciplinary people. So the question of, you know, will it be a computer scientist who's leading? Well, there may not be such a thing as a pure computer scientist. There may be computer scientist lawyers. And increasingly, that's what we're seeing with the course. That in the first year, four years ago, when it ran, we were very much getting people who only knew about their own disciplines. Increasingly, the people who want to take the course, they've worked as a lawyer in the tech startup. They've done some coding. They've been a computer scientist who's actually doing computer science and philosophy, and they've done maybe some legal work as well. So increasingly, I think we're not just seeing interdisciplinary teams, but actually interdisciplinary people. Yeah, so they may be the new the new cyborgs or the new kind of lawyers that we need, right? I always say to my students, don't be a dinosaur because dinosaurs, they tend to disappear. And here I would say being a dinosaur is to be just a lawyer or just a computer scientist. So uh, to both of you, uh, first of all, thank you very much for being on the panel, also for sitting on our advisory board. It was such a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. And on that, we move on to the next panel.